I am here today to share why I am hopeful and optimistic about the scariest, most all-encompassing challenge uh, that our society faces, climate change. Now, to do that, let me tell you a little bit about how I have come to dedicate the better part of the last two decades of my life to working on this issue. I grew up about a mile and a half south of where we stand right now. I never, growing up, would have been described as an environmentalist by any means. Uh, I did grow up in a family where we were reminded constantly that we had a responsibility to give back to our community, to preserve our community, to protect our community, and to pass it on to future generations in a better form that it was handed to us. Now, all of that being said, when I looked at the Berkshire Hills, I did not think I need to dedicate my career to protecting them. I thought, if I get on the other side of those hills, my father is no longer a law enforcement official where I am. <laughs> So I need to get over there some way, when or how. And I didn't want to just get over there for those reasons. I wanted to get over there to, to see more, to learn more. And the first person who helped me do that in any way that I have carried with me on this topic was Tony Affinney. You know, Tony was my professor uh, at Providence College. Uh, he taught politics of the environmental movement fall semester of my senior year. It was the first class, the first moment where I was confronted with both the, the brutal scientific reality of climate change, but also the challenging political reality of climate change. You know, I grew up in a family where we were told that public service was a noble calling, and then to learn that public servants either were ignoring the biggest challenge facing our society or acting against it challenged me to my core in almost every way that I thought about how politics and public service should operate. But at the same time, Tony didn't just try to scare us all into action and learning. He was an example for all of us in the class. He organized in his community. He advocated around environmental justice long before it was a buzzword and in every environmental plan. He was a living embodiment and example of the stubborn optimism that I would come to see throughout my career in folks who had dedicated their career to working on climate. That was incredibly important at that time as well because we were sitting in class you know, just months after the Kyoto Protocol, the first attempt to try to harness the globe's efforts around climate change had been rejected. Shortly after that, I was lucky enough to work for our then congressman in Western Mass, John Olver. Now, John Olver was brilliant in his own way. He was probably more likely to forget what day it was than it was than he was to remember which staffer was handling climate change on any given moment. But as much as he went about things in his own way, he had this incredible belief in democracy, in science, and in the idea that if people were presented with the facts about an issue, in a clear and consistent way, that they would support action on that issue. Now, this belief was challenged right as I was going to work for him. John Olver and Wayne Gilchrist, a Republican from Maryland, joined Senator McCain and Senator Lieberman as the lead sponsors of cap-and-trade legislation. That legislation, right around the time that I went to work for the congressman, died in only the way that something can die in the United States Senate, meaning it got 55 votes and not the 60 votes it needed to pass. Now, John and the other staffers who worked on that issue day and night could have easily rolled up the tents and said, our work here is done. What will we ever do? He could have cursed and mumbled about the coalition of Democrats from South Dakota and Arkansas and Louisiana who ultimately saw to the death of that legislation. But he didn't. Instead, he looked for every single step that he could take, every appropriations bill, every grant, every economic development effort, every step that he could take. And I do mean every. The last thing I worked on for the congressman as a staffer was the commencement address he gave at Westfield State in 2004. 
I feel like I still need to apologize to some of those students uh, because we had an ongoing debate that I'm pretty sure was not settled when he stepped up to the rostrum about if he should use the term global warming or climate change. But still, every single step along the way, that stubborn optimism that he carried with him, that I saw in countless other staffers who had been disappointed by the process, but refused to shirk the responsibility that they carried for their generation and for future generations. In 2006, after working for the congressman, I was supposed to be taking classes in grad school, and it turns out through one happenstance or another, I ended up on the ballot here in the Berkshires to serve as state senator for the 52 communities that gave me every opportunity in life. Shortly after a, a landslide margin of 243 votes, I was in office trying to figure out how to prioritize any number of different issues, of which climate was one. And while we were working on that with my staff, we found out that the electric rates uh, in the region had spiked, leading to the closure of, in particular, several paper factories uh, that had employed individuals for generations. We sat in middle school gymnasiums, in community centers with parents and family members, who looked around and said, we always went to work there, what are we going to do now? And at that moment, there were many people who wanted us to just go for the short-term, easy win, easy solution. If we just build more fossil fuel, that'll solve the problem, that'll make things better. But I couldn't bring myself to that. I couldn't accept that simply building a pipeline to tomorrow was somehow gonna be the solution when we needed to be thinking about the next generation. And so I was lucky enough to, at that time, be part of the work around our initial stages of climate work here in Massachusetts. Out here behind us, we have two megawatts of solar energy operating right over by Silver Lake. In 2006, when I was sworn into office, we had two megawatts of solar energy in this entire state. I used to stop and pull over and take a picture on my rudimentary flip phone camera that we had at the time that I'll never be able to explain to either of my sons, but I would stop and take a picture anytime I saw a solar project because they were that unique and different at the moment. Today, along with those two megawatts, we have 4,234 megawatts of Massachusetts, of solar here in Massachusetts, spread out over 145,831 installations of all sorts of different sizes. If you tried to stop and take a picture of everyone, you would never get anywhere. <laughs> For the last nine years, Massachusetts has been first in the nation in energy efficiency. Right now, turbines, blades, and other parts of facilities are being brought out to build the first offshore wind projects that we authorized in the last piece of legislation that I wrote. We have 330 megawatt hours of energy storage operating in this state and 2,700 megawatt hours in utility pipelines right now. Now, none of that is the work of one state senator. None of that is the work of one governor, one administration. It is the stubborn, optimistic work of tens of thousands of individuals every single day trying to think about what they could do in their own way, to be a part of the solution. And along the way, over those 15 years, we prove that you don't have to choose between the economy and the environment, that doing the right thing by the environment is doing the right thing by the economy. We decoupled emissions reduction and economic growth. The economy continued to grow in Massachusetts while emissions either held steady or declined. Now, come 2016, I started to look for a new job and tried to figure out what could I go off and do next. I was lucky enough to join, join Nexamp, a veteran-founded solar clean energy uh, developer. And when I joined that team, I got to see the magic that is taking an idea that is policy and implementing it, and seeing a team come together and do it. When I joined that team, we were 45 employees in three states just trying to figure out how we were gonna grow and how we could actually do this thing. When I left a couple of years ago, we were 300 employees in 13 states. Today, that company is north of 500 employees. 
developing projects from Hawaii to Maine, and my only complaint is I did not get to spend enough time in Hawaii when we began those efforts. Now, that team, beyond the numbers and the growth, the exciting thing about that team is I have never been a part of a team as diverse as that. Ideologically diverse, generationally diverse, gender diversity, racial diversity, you name it. Every type of diversity across that team. And it made us stronger and better. There were debates. There were disagreements. Plenty of them. But there was never a debate about what we were there to do. To try to build a future of energy that was clean and simple and accessible to everyone. And that's what we would remind ourselves of when we would come out of a meeting with a utility company scratching our heads saying, we're just trying to do the right thing. Why can't we break through here? That's what would happen when we would scratch our heads and say, we lost another project to somebody who just didn't want to look at a solar farm. That's what we would say when we said, we've got supply chain issues, we've got this, we've got that. Yes, but we also have a vision that we are going to be stubborn in our optimism around our ability to build. We are going to find a way to build a future of energy that is simple, clean, and accessible to everyone. Now, that future... That future is where I get to fix my gaze at the engine. The engine's a, a venture fund and public benefit corporation started by MIT to support tough tech entrepreneurs, founders, and teams. Generally tough to commercialize technology coming out of scientific and academic labs. Some of the most brilliant minds you will ever run into, I have the privilege of working with every single day. And while the work that we did when I was in the state senate, the work that we implemented at Nexamp, right, was clean tech 1.0, where we were rebuilding the electricity and energy grid. And it was critically important. Drove down the cost of solar, drove down the cost of wind, drove down the cost of batteries, and therefore EVs as well. That has also enabled this second generation of clean tech ideas that are coming forward. So every single day, I get to work with teams that are finding ways to commercialize fusion energy. Teams that are finding ways to commercialize and build and are building their first factory now for long duration energy storage. Teams that are finding ways to build high conducting uh, or high performing superconducting transmission wires so that we can get five to 10 times more power through the existing transmission corridors that we have right now. Teams building low carbon and no carbon cement, no carbon green steel, Teams that are out there separating emissions from chemical separations. Mining, food, wastewater, you name it. They are all working on it. But here's the important thing. It's not about the tech. Climate is not a tech problem. The reason that I am hopeful, both from the work that I do today, but also from the work that I have done over the last 20 years, is the people who have dedicated their careers to working on climate. They are some of the most brilliant, tireless, dedicated individuals you could ever hope to work with. And I consider it an honor to work with them every single day. The exciting thing about the work right now, too, is that it is not just the work going on at the engine. Because every one of those teams would tell you, there's another venture fund, there's another accelerator, they've got another three teams just like us. They've got another four teams just like us. There are tens, hundreds, thousands of individuals just like us working on these issues. And the exciting thing along with that now is that they finally have the support to get them there. With the federal government's efforts on the Inflation Reduction Act, on the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, and on CHIPS Plus Science. So that has put a sail in their winds, or put a wind in their sails, but it also hasn't been the reason that they're doing it. Why did they dedicate themselves to this work? Because they looked back and said, I have a responsibility to do this. It wasn't just that someday it will be profitable, it's that someone has to do this. Someone has to find a way to commercialize fusion energy. Someone has to find a way to take emissions out of cement. It's the team and the people. The reason I am hopeful about where we are on climate right now is not because we don't have a lot of work. We had a lot of work to do. It is because of the teams and the people I've had the honor and the privilege of working alongside. 
So my only ask of you when we leave this great place today is that if you run into anyone who says, what can you do? Think about them and think about the people you know who are working on these issues. What can we do? What could we do other than be hopeful and support their efforts at this moment? Thank you all so much. Have a great day. Thank <laughs> you.